So uh, last week in Alaska, there were a couple hikers who went missing. They, uh, they started hiking down what's called the Stampede Trail in the Denali National Park. And after they didn't come back for a while, uh, search and rescue crews were dispatched. And uh, they went looking for them. And eventually, uh, just a couple days ago now, uh, these two hikers were found uh, in an old abandoned bus in the middle of the Alaskan wild. And one of the reasons that this story even made the news is because this old abandoned bus is famous. I wonder if some of you now are maybe catching on. Uh, th- this, this old abandoned bus, this is the same bus that hiker Chris McCandless died in back in 1992. And some of you may know about Chris McCandless. Um, there's a movie about his story called Into the Wild. Have any of you guys ever seen the movie? Into the Wild? Okay, yeah. One of my, my favorite movies. And the story is pretty simple. Uh, McCandless, he, he finished up college in, back in 1990, but then he abandoned the conventional world, and he became a vagabond, and he hitchhiked his way to Alaska, and, and he basically was searching for the meaning of life. That's what he was looking for. And so... Uh, he hiked deep down the Stampede Trail, deep into the Alaskan wild, and he got stuck. So he, he camps out in this old abandoned bus that was part of going to be a railroad thing that got closed down. He, 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 uh, he camps out there, stays there, suffers from just incredible loneliness, and eventually he died in the bus from starvation. And he kept a journal, which is, which is how we know these things. He kept a journal, and one of the last sentences that, that he wrote was this. This is what he said. He said, happiness is only real when it's shared. Happiness is only real when it's shared. So he went alone. He went alone by himself, went alone on this entire journey looking for happiness, and in the end he learned that happiness doesn't happen alone. His story, and this is, this is one of the reasons I, I like the movie, his story stresses to us the importance of relationships and community and fellowship. His story reminds us that people matter. Our relationships with other people matter, and this, this goes for everybody. Relationships are one of the most central things, one of the most important things in our lives, right? I mean, think about it. Think about, think about your life, where you live, your, your home, your family, your friends, your neighbors. Think of all the relationships that you're connected to. Those relationships are relationships that you were made for. The, these relationships are a big, big part of your life. So why then do relationships have to be so hard? I think we all can agree that relationships are important. I mean, it's easy. We get that. We can agree relationships are important. The the Chris McCandless story makes that clear. But if relationships are so important, why do they have to be so complicated? Because we know relationships are complicated. I think we all can agree that relationships are complex. Some of the greatest pain and most consistent frustrations in our lives are relational. In fact, I'm pretty sure that every one of us in this room have some type of relational brokenness going on. And I know, I know specifically some of you have relational brokenness happening in your life right now. I know that. Relationships are important, but they're not easy, and that means that we need some help. We need help here. And I think the book of Philemon can help us. I think this little letter that Paul wrote, Philemon, can offer us some guidance when it comes to relationships. So let me give a little bit of background on this book, and then we'll get into it. Speaking of relational complexity, the situation behind this letter is that. Philemon, or, or Philemon, however you want to say it, um, he was a Christian in the city of Colossae who, who hosted the church in his home. Verse 2 tells us that. Some scholars think that he might even have been a pastor in the church. But either way, um, Paul is writing to Philemon from prison, and here's why. Here, here, here's the deal. Paul had, has recently met a man named Onesimus. Onesimus, Onesimus, whatever's fine. 
Paul meets Onesimus and Paul explained the gospel to him and Onesimus believed the gospel. Onesimus became a Christian and he actually started helping Paul in ministry. Okay? But here's where it gets complicated. Onesimus is a runaway slave who used to work for Philemon. And we talked about slavery and the exhortation. Um, but to say the least here in this situation, to say the least of the situation between Philemon and Onesimus, there is some type of relational strife that's going on here. We don't know the full details. We don't know them. But we do know that things are not in good shape between these two men, Philemon and Onesimus. Some even think that Onesimus may have stolen things from Philemon and ran away, because in verse 18, if you notice, um, Paul says that he would pay back to Philemon whatever Onesimus owes. But whatever it is that caused it, whatever it is here, there is a relational rift going on, and I think it's a good thing that we don't know the full details. See, there are so little details said about the specifics with Philemon and Onesimus that therefore this letter applies to all types of relational brokenness. And I think that's why it's in the Bible, for that reason. And so here you go. If you have relationship problems this morning, this letter can help. And let me just clarify, I, I'm not talking about, I'm ta- I am talking about non-romantic relationships. This is not a sermon on dating. This is not a sermon on marriage. I'm talking about friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, non-romantic relationships. If you have relational tension there, this letter can help us. So let me get there. Two lessons I want us to see. There are two lessons with some implications in this letter. I want us to check it out. First, The first lesson is that everybody can't stay friends. And the second lesson is that the gospel really is for relationships. Let me start with the first. Lesson number one, this is a category here. Number one, everybody can't stay friends. Let me read to you from Philemon verses four to six. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So everybody can't say friends. If I were to say it in a more positive way, it's that relational restoration requires common ground. And I want to start here because I think this is where the Apostle Paul starts. And I think it it really helps us at the level of expectations. As far as expectations go, one question that we should ask is whether we should expect that every relational rift be mended. There are plenty of problems out there. We've we've said that. And the goal, we would assume, in all these relational problems is that the bad things go away that the good things be restored. And I'm asking, is that right? Should we expect that? Should we expect and hope that all of our relational woes go away? And I think no. I don't think we should expect that. That's because relationships really can't be restored unless there's a shared starting point. There needs to be a common ground, and that's what Paul establishes right away. Notice what Paul says to Philemon in verse six. He prays, this is the ESV, he prays that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. And that's actually a clunky way, I think, to translate this verse. The word sharing here is the word koinonia, which means fellowship or partnership. And and that's more what Paul has in mind. So what he intends to say is that he wants the fellowship or the partnership of Philemon's faith to be effective. And so we should ask, okay, Philemon's fellowship with who? Philemon's partnership with who? And we see that Paul is talking about the fellowship and the partnership that Philemon has with him and with Onesimus because of their faith in Jesus. Paul is praying that the fellowship Philemon shares with him and Onesimus because of their faith will then lead Philemon to do the right thing. In other words, Paul says, there's a common ground here. We gotta establish this. There's a common ground here we're working from. And there, you know, you guys know, there are lots of English translations of the Bible. 
and a, a few really good ones. And I really like the way the new international version puts verse 6. L- listen to the NIV, how they translate verse, verse 6. Paul says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. I, I, think, that's, I think that's right on. It's out of the shared fellowship they have in the gospel that restoration is going to come. That's what Paul is saying. It's out of this shared partnership in the gospel that restoration will happen. Paul says that the resources needed to mend the relational rift between Philemon and Onesimus are found in the faith they share, and that's why everybody can't be friends. Because not every relationship is going to share the resources needed to put the relationship back together. Does that make sense? There has to be a common ground. To be more specific here, to, to, be, to be more specific, Paul, what, what, what Paul says in this letter is really about Christian relationships. He's really speaking to Christians about their Christian relationships because only Christian relationships share the common ground necessary for restoration. It's Christian relationships that have this shared fellowship in the gospel, and that leads us now to two implications. So two implications under this category. First, typical relationships lack resources for restoration, and therefore restoration is nearly impossible. Number two, Christian relationships have the gospel as the resource for restoration, and therefore, restoration is just not possible. It's essential. So let me take the first implication here. Now, when I say typical relationships, I'm talking about any relationships where the people involved are not Christians. I'm I'm talking about relationships where believing the gospel is, is not held in common. The point is that two people in typical relationships do not share a common faith in the gospel, and therefore they don't have access to the gospel's resources to heal and and restore. And just so you know, I'm not talking about uh, restoring things after some silly disagreement. I'm talking about serious wrong. When serious wrong has happened between two people, that's what I'm talking about. And without the gospel's resources to heal and restore, without the authority and incentive of the gospel, I'm saying that it's, it's, it's really, really hard to put broken relationships back together. And in fact, and I, I read through this, I, this is going to sound a little bit harsh, okay? So stick with me through this. But without the gospel... The only reason I can imagine we'd ever do the hard work of putting back relationships is because we, let me just read this again. It's kind of clunky. Here you go. Without the gospel, the only reason I can imagine we'd ever do the hard work of putting broken relationships back together is because of either we get something from the other person or we find our significance in what others think about us. And that sounds a little harsh, okay? Um, but think, think, think for a second with me here. Um, unless God has told you to do it, unless we are embracing the gospel, the only reason that I can think of for fixing broken relationships is because we're either selfish or we're like Michael Scott, okay? Either, either, either it's that the other person has something we want and, and we need to keep things smooth in order to get that something. That, that's what people mean when they say, don't burn bridges. You guys have heard that phrase. We use that phrase, right? Don't, don't burn your bridges. That means we don't want to mess up things so bad relationally that we cut off access to what that person has. This is conventional, worldly wisdom, and at heart, it's selfish, okay? That's not a Christian idea. That's selfish. And that's one of the reasons why People try to mend broken relationships. They need, they want something the other person has. The other reason is that we're, we're like Michael Scott, which means, some of you may get this, I'll explain. It means that we just cannot bear the thought of someone else not liking us. Uh, so Michael Scott is the main character in the TV show, The Office, which ran for nine seasons. Are there any Office fans out here? Okay, my wife and I love the office. And well, in the show, uh, Michael Scott's character, he, he's the boss of a paper company, Dunder Mifflin, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And he is known in the show, he's known for craving the approval of others. And I think he may have said it best in season four 
In an interview, this is what Michael Scott said. He said, do I need to be liked? Absolutely not. I like to be liked. I enjoy being liked. I have to be liked. But it's not like this compulsive need to be liked, like my need to be praised. Right? And there's another time he said, he said, as a boss, do I want to be feared or loved? He said, I want both. I want people to fear how much they love me. <laughs> and, and this is comedy, right? This is good. This is good stuff. And we're supposed to laugh at that. And it's also true of us a lot of times. See, we're supposed to laugh at that. That's a funny thing. And a lot of times, that's how we look. That's how we think. Without the gospel, unless God has told us to do it, I think the craving to be light is a big reason why we try to solve relational strife. We just can't stand the thought that someone thinks badly of us. And so our attempts for restoration actually become some kind of reputation recovery project. We just don't want them thinking bad about us. Without the gospel, we either try to solve relational tension because the other person has something we want, or we crave to be liked. And that's why most of the time, it will not work. It just won't work. Not true restoration. Without the gospel, without a shared faith in the gospel, we lack the resources needed for true restoration, and therefore restoration is going to be hard. Now, the second implication. Christian relationships have the gospel as a resource for restoration. And therefore, restoration is just not possible, it's essential. And I I say this almost, hear me, I I say this almost tongue-in-cheek, because in reality, there are a lot of Christian relationships that act like typical relationships. There's a lot of Christian restoration that operates out of a a selfishness and a craving to be light. So, so hear me when I say this. We Christians, we do not have this all figured out. Although there is a way that it should be. There is a vision for how it should look. The gospel leads to rec- restoration. It actually makes restoration between Christians essential. And that's because the gospel faith that Christians share, it doesn't just recommend restoration, it accomplishes restoration. That's what it does. It makes that happen. And that, that leads us to the second lesson of this letter. Uh, number two, the gospel really is for relationships. Let me, this, Sam read this earlier. Let me read to you verses eight and nine again. Paul says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is, what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Then down in verse 14, He says, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will, of your own accord. So let's let's track with what Paul is saying here. Paul, he's an apostle of the early church, which means that he has a special authority given him by Jesus to lead the church. We've seen this in the book of Acts. Paul was responsible for the spread of Christianity in the early world, and he also wrote 13 books of the New Testament, okay? So he's kind of a big deal, all right? Agree? He's kind of a big deal. This is the apostle Paul here. He has the authority and the right to just tell Philemon what to do. This entire letter is not very long, but it could be a lot shorter. It could be basically a sentence. Dear Philemon, you must make things right with Onesimus. Sincerely, Paul. That could be the book. Paul has the authority to just say it. That's not what he does. Instead, he appeals to Philemon for love's sake. He's not mechanically forcing Philemon to restore the relationship with Onesimus. He wants to win Philemon's heart. Paul is gently prodding Philemon to do what is right because of their shared faith in the gospel. And we need to get this, okay? The only reason Paul can do it this way is because he knows the gospel has what it takes, Paul is so confident in the gospel's power to restore what is broken that he doesn't have to take things into his own hands. There's confidence here in the gospel's power. He simply reminds Philemon of the gospel faith they share and he lets the gospel do its thing. 
And I should say here that this is one thing that makes Christianity different from every other religion out there. The Christian gospel has this remarkable ability to captivate the heart. See, that's not how Islam works. The word Islam means submission. And it's, it, it's, it's basically, you better submit to Allah or else. And, and throughout world history, the way that Islam has spread, the way that people can, are converted to Islam through most of church history has come when a sword is put to their neck. Islam uses power and empty promises to force people. That's how it works. But see, Christianity is the gospel. It's, it's good news. It's not about what you must do. It's about what's been done for you by grace. And that's why it's good news. It, it's that you do not, we, us, now, you do not have what it takes for God to accept you. You can't pray enough. You can't fast enough. You can't give enough alms. You, we cannot make God love us. You can't make God love you. Five pillars, whatever you want to do, you can't make him love you. But God does love you. See? Hear the good news? God does love you, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. He loves you, in fact, so truly that although you deserve his judgment for your sin, he sent his son Jesus to take that judgment for you. That's what the cross is all about. And it's the center of the gospel because the cross is where Jesus comes and in our place, in your place, he takes the punishment that we deserve for our sin. He suffered in our place on the cross, bore the punishment, bore God's wrath in our place. And the Bible tells us in Romans 5 verse 8 that there at the cross, when that happened, when Jesus did that, that is where God showed us that he loved us. Not because of what we've done, Not because of anything we could ever do. God showed us he loved us there because of who he is. Because he is a God of grace. Despite ourselves, despite ourselves at the greatest cost to himself, God loves us. That's the gospel. And that is coming for your heart. See, that is meant to win your heart. Because it's good news. It's so good. The gospel is so good that it has this remarkable ability to captivate us. To win us over. And Paul knows that. Paul knows that. Which is why he doesn't have to force Philemon here. He just says, Philemon, remember the gospel that we shared. The faith that we share. Remember the gospel that we believe. Remember. See, the gospel it has the power to restore. That's what the gospel does. It's about taking two parties, God and people, who are separated by this incredible relational rift, and it brings them back together. It reconciles them together. The gospel restores people back into a relationship with God. The gospel restores people back to one another, and one day the gospel will restore this entire world to what it should be. The gospel then really is, the gospel is for relationships. And this became very real to Melissa and I, I think five years ago. Um, we were living here in Minneapolis, and um, our family, they're all back in the Carolinas. And Melissa, growing up, she had a rough relationship with her dad. Um, her dad was, uh, was a, an alcoholic. He was abusive. He pretty much deserted her family when she was in eighth grade. And so for a while there, she had no relationship at all with her dad. And then later in high school and in, in, in college, she began to piece things back together. And there was, you know, some, some stuff that came back together there. But then when we moved here, there just, this, this, this big thing happened. And it was just an explosion that pretty much uh, ruined things for a while. And there is one of those things, just layers come out. You know, it's like you find a little string and you kind of keep pulling the string. It's like you keep pulling it. You, keep, you guys know what I'm saying? Like you, you get into a relational, it's just layers and layers and layers of relational um, complexity. And it was almost overwhelming for us. Like we just didn't know what, almost overwhelming. And you know what I mean. You, you've, you guys know this, right? You've been there. It's overwhelming for us. And in the middle of all that, it occurred to me one day 
that the gospel is meant for this. And we're just in this, we're just, try, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. And it occurred to me, yeah, the gospel is for this. The gospel is for this. And as complicated as it was, in a very clear sense, we knew what, what we had to do. We knew what needed to happen. We knew that we had the gospel resources to forgive. And this is Melissa, my wife. She, she really stepped out here. And in, a, and in an amazing, head-turning sort of way, uh, she gave forgiveness, and it changed everything. Um, I think of all the resources that the gospel gives us, forgiveness is often the main one, right, when it comes to restoring relationships. Because when, when things break, when something goes wrong, something has caused them to go wrong, and that something is usually one person wronging another. And there are so many practical things to say here. I'm going to run out of time, but uh, every situation is different too, so take this as it's helpful. But when it comes to Christian relationships, when two Christians have a relational rift, repentance and forgiveness is essential. It's got to happen. You guys remember what Peter said to Jesus that time? He said, Jesus, uh, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Like, like seven times? You guys remember this story? Peter's talking, this is Matthew 18, talking to Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Maybe, maybe seven times? And Jesus says, try, try 70 times seven. By which he means you never, you never stop forgiving your brother because God has never stopped forgiving you. It's with this mercy that we've experienced from God that we can give mercy. And I think we get that. We, we, we know that's not news to us. It's still not easy, though. It's not easy, but it's clear. We are supposed to forgive. More difficult, though, are those situations where the person who has wronged you does not share your faith in the gospel, or maybe they don't care anything about restoring the relationship. What do you do then? What if the desire for restoration is asymmetrical? Or what if, what if restoration is on some kind of impossible terms, meaning that you have to defy your Christian faith to make it work? Because I have one of those in my life right now. What if that's it? What do we do then? Well, whatever we do, we do this. We make sure that we are not the ones who hinder the restoration. You know, we can't control how other people respond to things. We can't control what they do. That's not our part. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility has to do with ourselves, with what we're doing. And if there's a relational rift in your life, the question you should ask is, does this relational rift exist because of my refusal to ask for or give forgiveness? You need to ask that question. If you have, if we have a relational rift in our life right now, we need to ask, is this because I can't say I'm sorry or is it because I can't say I forgive you? Is it on me? I have to ask that question. Is this relational rift on me? We ask that question and we make sure it's not. Again, there's so much more to say about forgiveness. Quickly, when we ask for forgiveness, just, just to clarify when I, what I mean by forgiveness here, there's a lot more to say, but when we ask for forgiveness, we're not asking for an excuse, okay? We are at, for asking for forgiveness is admitting that what we did was wrong, and so we make ourselves vulnerable at the other person's mercy. And, when we give forgiveness, it's never wholesale acceptance of the other person, and it's never a justification of the wrong they did. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is simply to stop holding against the other person the wrong that they did. Really, forgiveness is to absorb the debt that the other person owes. And if you believe the gospel, you have those resources. You have the resources 
to ask for forgiveness and you have the resources to give forgiveness because you have experienced those firsthand. And that's what this table represents. That's what this table's about. So as the, as the pastors now and the deacons come and get ready, um, we need to remember that the only reason broken relationships can be healed is because Jesus' body was broken for us. The only way, this, the only way you can ask for forgiveness is because you've already been forgiven in the most ultimate sense. And the only way you can give forgiveness is because the forgiveness God has given you is bigger and deeper than any kind that we could ever give ourselves. That's what's represented at this table. That's what this table is about. The resources that we need, honestly, the resources we need for restoration are the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And at this table, Jesus gives you those resources. He gives you his resources. If you have those resources, if you're here with us this morning and you share this gospel faith, we invite you. If you share this gospel faith, we invite you to eat and to drink with us. We do this, this meal every week for the members of cities, but if you're here and you fellowship with us in the gospel, we want to invite you to eat and drink with us. And we'll start with the bread. If you want the gluten-free option, just raise your hand. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.